Hey there gang, up next we've got a 2004 Gibson SG. And you know what they say, it's not a real Gibson, unless it's got a broken headstock. Yep, this one graduated. It's time has come. Hi there, guitar repair fans. I'm your classic Gibson headstock fracture, and I'm here to tell you that that insightful diatribe you're thinking of posting in the comment section has all been said a million times before. And frankly, at this point, it just makes you sound boring. So with that out of the way, yeah, this is kind of familiar, isn't it? I think we've seen this type of thing before. I've done a number of these, but people seem to really get a kick out of watching me fix them, so I don't mind. It's nice having you hanging around in the shop while I'm doing it. Welcome aboard. Um, I'll try to answer all the questions I get every time I do one of these. Um, so what am I going to do? I'm going to glue it up. I'm going to put some splines in there. Are the splines necessary? Yes, probably. They're really important in cases where you've got the headstock completely broken off, say right behind the nut, where you've got two pieces of end grain trying to butt against each other. In that case, yeah, they act as a positioning device and also add a lot of integrity to the, the joint after you're done. In this case, we've got a pretty long uh, angle joint here. The headstock facing is all in one piece. It didn't break. It's nice. Very good. So in this case, uh, it's less important, but the splines, mm, let's say, it's kind of a psychological thing as well. Say 20 years from now, someone's going to buy this guitar. Turns it over. Oh, yeah, broken headstock. If you see a couple of really nicely fit splines in there, it's almost a kind of assurance. It's, yes, someone really cared to have this thing fixed by someone who knew what they were doing. It's obvious that pains were taken. So it's good. You know, it certainly doesn't hurt. It can add some strength. If this thing ever breaks again, oftentimes they act as a kind of positioning device. Material for the splines. I'm going to use mahogany because that's what the neck is made out of. You could use a harder wood, and I have also used um, carbon fiber. Is it better with a carbon fiber? Yes and no. Here's the thing. The carbon fiber, if we drop this guitar again, it doesn't matter what you put in there. It will break. It's more a function of just the design. The carbon fiber perhaps won't break in exactly the same spot, but what it does is that the impact force is pushed along the length of the carbon fiber, and wherever it stops, that's where the break is going to happen. Could be up in the headstock, could be down in the neck. This will also happen if you do a back strap of carbon fiber all the way across. If you drop it again, the fracture is going to happen right where the carbon fiber stops and where the mahogany starts. Length of the splines should be long enough, but you can do them really long, but again, it will break right through. I've seen this happen. Sometimes uh, the headstock will fracture around the, uh, the splines. It's just, if you put this thing on a stand and it falls backwards, it's going to break. If you have it in a case held upright and let it drop, it's going to break. It's what they do. And it's a kind of concession you make. If you're going to be a Gibson player, you accept that that could happen, and you take very, you know, lots of precautions to not let your guitar drop. Seems to be one of those individuals who likes to pass the string back through the hole in the tuner. I'm not sure if this gains anything in tuning stability, but it does make it more difficult to take them off. One thing I notice about these days when I'm making a video is how quiet the shop is. I'm usually listening to a podcast or music, and I don't really want to get hit with copyright infringement, so we're working in silence. Okay, test run complete here. Some experimentation was necessary. It can be difficult to get them to close up all the way along the joint, especially in these, I call them double lobes, uh, the ones that break off into two sections um, into the cheek area. Uh, just to put clamps on a flat call sometimes doesn't push them all the way down at the ends. So you can see I use these wedges here. These are maple wedges, and I've got cork on the bottom of them uh, to prevent denting the mahogany if possible. That looks pretty good. I'm going to take a photo of this so that in the heat of the moment I know where things should be. <laughs> Just cleaning up the glue residue. That sat down very nicely. I can still feel the cracks in the lacquer, of course, but the underlying form is very continuous. There's no major bumps or lumps. It's very good. There's one little divot here from the corner of the wedge, uh, but that's probably going to get cut out when I do the splines, and if not, I could fill it. 
looking good so far. The question arises whether I should do these super glue crack fills before or after I've cut the uh, channels for the splines and installed them. I've done them both ways. At this point I think I like to do this the fills first because it consolidates the edges of the cracks a little bit more. Like There's always the chance that it could be hit by the uh, router bit and want to fracture off. The other thing it does is just adds a layer. Eventually I'm going to want to um, level sand all of this area and this kind of helps level things out a bit more. It gives me material to level through. So I'll probably do two coats of this super glue. Now I don't know about you, but I don't think it's a good idea to route into the truss rod with a spinning router bit. Checking things out here, the pocket at its widest is about 15 and a half millimeters. I'll remove the nut and I'll see if I can remove the washer. This is one of the guitars Gibson sprayed over without taping off. So there's some lacquer over top of the, uh, the washer. See if we can excavate that. I've cut myself a piece of tape, which I'm going to center on the back of the headstock here by eye, as close as I can. It's around 17 millimeters, so there's a bit extra to spare. And that'll just give me a visual cue so I know roughly where the truss rod pocket is and I can put the splines on either side of it. Okay, I've got my jig clamped in place. You've seen this before. So it's just a little trough for my router, clamps to the headstock rests against the neck shaft. In this case I've got a small padded call on the, the fingerboard surface here so I can um, steady it a little bit better with this tiny little C-clamp. I route to depth in two passes. I've got this piece of hardboard here which acts as a riser so I don't have to change the settings on my little laminate trimmer. Do the first pass, remove this, do the second pass, and I'm at the full depth. How do I figure out what the full depth of slot is? Well, I've marked out the approximate length of the slot here, and I can measure down from the underside of the jig to the full depth of slot. And on a Les Paul here, it's usually around 22 millimeters on this jig. Just double checking that, and yes, that's fine. 22 millimeters will give us a couple of extra millimeters um, below the surface of the fretboard and also the headstock facing. So in other words, I wouldn't, I'm not in danger of routing through the front surface of the headstock and having my router bit appear out here. That would be bad. So I'm going to take that measurement of 22 millimeters and then add on the full depth of the bottom of the jig here, which is 11 millimeters, gives us 33. So my router bit is going to have to project 33 millimeters below the surface of its base plate. There we go. I know it looks weird, but you have to remember that a good portion of this is going to be taken up by the jig, so we're not going to have this much bit into the wood at any one time. I've been using the same mask for over a month now. You can see the thickness of the lacquer has frayed just a little bit there, right on the edge of the slot. So it probably means it's time for a new router bit. People have asked how I make the splines. And there's really no trick to it. Just start off with an oversized blank of mahogany and plane it down till it's the correct thickness. In this case I'm 5 16ths of an inch, so that should be around uh, 312 thousandths. And uh, I'll go slightly oversized and then I can kind of fine-tune my fit. It's not so tight that I have to push firmly to get it into place. And it's not loose either. It just fits just perfectly. It's also a characteristic sound. When it's just the right fit, you sort of hear the wood fibers brushing against each other as it glides on into place. If this was too tight, you're kind of in danger because the spline will absorb water from the glue and it will expand. And in extreme cases, you could probably crack the headstock from the spline up into the uh, lower tuner hole here. That's what we want though. To get the correct length I'll use my calipers here for the inside measurement. I'll transfer this measurement to the blank. I'm using a square and a scalpel. I'm actually going to score all the way around so I'm going to keep things nice and perpendicular. 
uh, take the scalpel and put it in the little nick made from the cut on the face, slide the square up to it. That's going to be a nice clean continuous line. This is an extension of Paul Sellers, uh, he calls it a knife wall technique. He's an English woodworker. That's where I learned this from. Same thing on this side. I've put it in the previous uh, nick there, move the square up. I can use this very fine exacto razor saw right in the knife kerf. So I cut through one side and then I start ro rotating in the knife kerf. This prevents um, the ends from breaking out. And also, the saw cuts act like their own guide, like it's sort of guiding the saw all the way down in. Yeah, so we get a very clean cut at right angles. Now to get the hemispheres on the end, I've taken my caliper and the total width here, I've divided that by two to give me a center line for the radius. And to be honest, I usually do this by eye, but you could get something like this. This is a circle template. Try to pencil it in. I don't know if that's worth it. I'll just lop the corners off. A few strokes on the sanding block. And I can use a file. You pay attention and you trust yourself. It's amazing how accurately you can do this kind of thing. Now I can use a strip of sandpaper. This is 120 grit. I just sort of roll it over and shoe shine it. And I'll get something that is just fine. The last thing I'm going to do before I glue this, and this is kind of a subtlety, is I'm very lightly going to chamfer the corner on the, uh, the bottom here. Sometimes what can happen in this sort of right angle gluing situation is you get kind of a hydraulic lock where there's no place for the glue to go and it can be hard to get this thing firmly seated. So just putting that little chamfer on the corner there makes the thing sure to bottom out and it's going to be well glued to both the sides and the bottom. Don't dilly dally. Just get a bunch of glue in there. As, as I said before, these things are going to swell as soon as the glue hits them, so got to get them in place. Not too much trouble. There we go. Shouldn't even need clamping. That'll be in there fine. While we're at it, let's take a second to repair Jasmine here. Glue her back on her perch. So it's time to start carving these things down so the splines blend in with the surface around them. Again, there's no real trick to this, it's just carving. People ask, how do you keep from going too far and cutting into the lacquer? And I mean, the answer is just don't cut into the lacquer. Be mindful of what you're doing. Light cuts, sharp tool, plan your movements, make relief cuts if necessary. Like if you can feel the knife starting to go too deep, you stop. Maybe make a light cut in front of it so that it has some place to break off, if you know what I mean. Mostly just pay attention. What I like to do is focus on the edges, um, trying to get those down first you know, to the surface of the neck around them. And that way I can kind of blend into the correct line. Uh, so I'll cut this down on both sides. There'll be a hump in the middle that I can very carefully scrape down using either a razor blade or a chisel or the knife blade. And then blend the two surfaces together. You can find interesting ways of holding your knife. You know, sometimes it's not the most comfortable, but you got to do it because the grain wants you to go a certain direction. Well, you do what the grain tells you. A legal machine gun with the goal of running weapons to Cuban rebels. In Wisconsin. <laughs> From Wisconsin. You know the classic.
classic Wisconsin to Cuba flight path it is. and some depressing places. But entertaining murder probably at the end. Entertaining murder for sure. I don't know if you yeah. guys have noticed that, but well, there's a pattern no, where you go no, like, oh, no. and then like somebody else dies and you go like, yeah. <laughs> It's a bit of a whiplash episode. We're all over the place. So, I sprayed a light coat of lacquer on the area just to seal the bare surface of the wood. And here I'm using some uh, water-based pore filler. I'm using Aqua Coat these days, in which I've mixed some brown dye, just to try to mimic the grain filler that Gibson uses on the rest of the neck. It kind of makes the pores pop out a little bit. So I'll probably do a couple coats of this, then I'll sand this off very carefully, uh, just leaving it down in the pores. Just been mixing up a concoction here for the touch-up. I will say this, matching the transparent red colors that Gibson uses is never an easy task, for a couple of reasons. Uh, red dyes just naturally tend to be fugitive. In other words, they will shift color over time, and that can be due to like chemical reactions within the lacquer, uh, how much exposure to UV and oxygen they get, and just general fading. Um, they'll start to look washed out. Like if you take the pick guard off an SG that's 10 years old, you'll definitely see how much the color has changed from when it left the factory. Even if you leave it in the case, it'll change. And because of this, you can't really just pick a color off the shelf and expect it to be perfect. Um, Stumac is now selling aerosol cans with some useful colors. It's probably a good place to start. Like it'll get you in the ballpark and probably be good enough in a lot of cases. But they won't ship those across the border to me, and even if they did, it would cost me a mint because of the hazardous fees. And in the end, it's just it's not going to be an exact match anyway, so it just makes more sense for me to blend my own. The other thing is, because we're dealing with transparent colors, it's not like you can just lay out a coat on top and have it blend in seamlessly. It's an additive process, right? So every extra layer you put on there, there's more pigment between your eye and the wood surface, and it gets more and more saturated the thicker it gets, and it gets darker. So if I was to mix up a batch of lacquer that matched this one perfectly and sprayed it on top, it's not going to be this color, right? It's going to be this times two. Um, funny thing is, like, the browns tend to be a lot more forgiving. Uh, your eye will blend them together optically and it just sort of lets it go. It's like, yeah, whatever. But when you get to the reds, blues, and greens, they seem to really call attention to themselves, and you can really tell when something's been done to them. So we have to temper expectations. Like, unless you're willing to completely strip the whole neck off and respray it, which is just a huge job, you're going to see some difference where the overspray starts. That's just life. And the goal is to try and make it look unified and presentable. It won't disappear. To tint the lacquer, I use a concentrated liquid dye. Um, sometimes I'll use an aniline dye powder um, if it gets me closer to the color I need. This powder is actually designed as a water stain, but I did some experiments with it and I found that it dissolves just fine in lacquer thinner. So I go ahead and use it. Um, for the red here, I also just add the tiniest drop of amber to it. You know how Gibson's lacquer gets really yellow over time? Well, this takes the sort of bluish edge out of what's really a ruby red and kind of softens things up a little bit. And I have to play with the proportions to get something usable. Like, it'll be darker in the bottle than it will be on the guitar, obviously. And when it's right, it tends to look an awful lot like blood in the bottle, like a specimen. And to spray, I just use the inexpensive Stumac airbrush. It does the job. Like, I would love to have an Iwata or a Pache, but I just can't justify that expense for the amount of spraying I do with these things. And I actually like that they use these little tiny bottles for the paint. It has this fitting that sucks it right out of the bottle, and then afterwards you can just put a top on it, and I can save it for later in case I need to do a little bit of touch-up or something, um, or go back and respray. I swear to you, this shot was in focus before I hit record. Okay, with the color coats on here, you can see we came pretty close. It's a little bit darker, which we expected it would be. That's one of the reasons I shot two thin coats of clear lacquer on here first. What that lets me do is take an abrasive pad or 600 grit sandpaper and come back and abrade back a little ways to that clear lacquer and soften the transition line between the repair and the uh, original color of the headstock. It creates sort of a gradient effect rather than a hard line and uh, it just looks better.
After this, I will uh, start shooting some lacquer coats on there. I'll probably put on three thin coats, let that dry for a day, sand it back level if I can, put two more coats on, and then I'll be ready for final leveling and polishing. Okay, it's been six days since the finished coats went on, and you can see there's been time for the lacquer to cure and to shrink up a little bit. This is why it's important to leave adequate time between spraying and level sanding and buffing, because these witness lines appear, and it's good to have that happen now in this nice pebbly surface I can sand back, rather than the final polished one. Still, the lacquer is going to continue shrinking for months, to be honest, and there might be some slight ghosting that appears later on, but as they say, them's the breaks. I'm block sanding with some 1000 grit wet dry paper here, lubricated with a little bit of water. Now if you're an auto body specialist, you know you're supposed to soak this stuff overnight or for a very long time, get it completely saturated, but I'm not taking very much off here. I'm not using very much uh, pressure, so I just use the paper dry and just wet the surface. After this, I'll use some 1200 grit and then some 24 and 3600 grit micro mesh. I'll be ready to hand buff it, rub it by hand using auto body compounds and swirl mark remover. You gotta be careful because like things like these edges here, there's not that much finish built up on those. So you kind of work your way up to them and go after them with the uh, the higher grit. All right, I think we'll call this video done. That looks okay. It's good enough to send back out into the world. And I still have to do a setup on this guitar, so I'm not going to play it for you. I think you guys probably know what an SG sounds like anyway, or at least I hope you do. And I'll see you next week. I'll probably end up doing that uh, multi-episode thing where we'll take a big repair and break it down into daily installments for you. So until then, uh, stay safe, and thanks for watching.